All right. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to I'm seeing lots of faces and mugs and cats. It's a it's always a good morning when you get that kind of that kind of a start to it. I guess it's morning for me. It's not morning for all of you. Um, Michelle, are you feeling ready? Great. All right. It's my pleasure to introduce for our kickoff for the last day of talks, this is Dr. Michelle Fung. She's a McDonald Fellow at the California Institute of Technology. She's gonna to talk to us today about topological techniques for working with data. Take it away, Michelle. Thanks, Heather. Um, and thank you everyone for being here today on day three. Um, so this is gonna be kind of an interesting talk. I'm going to be kind of combining a slide talk and a chalk talk um, because I think that for a lot of things in topology, it's easiest if you have pictures and it also helps to like watch those pictures get drawn in front of you. And since we're virtual, I can't sort of vaguely gesture with my hands every 15 seconds. So we're gonna be trying this iPad thing. Um, so, oh, sorry, wrong direction. All right, um, so this is the outline of the talk. I'm going to be kind of starting here with an overview of like algebraic topology and a take on the history of algebraic topology. So if there are any like serious algebraic topologists um, in the audience, please don't come for me. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about like applied topology and kind of what applied topology has looked like in the past, what it looks like now. Um, usually when I give talks on TDA, I kind of give a survey and the point is to convince you that there are a lot of interesting applications and that this is something that you can use. But Today, because this is a course, I'm going to be glossing over it a little bit. So there's going to be a very long list of references at the end of these slides, which I will be posting um, after this talk, which you can look into if you're curious about specific applications of topology, um, like what kinds of things they're getting used on and exactly how they're going to be used. The majority of this talk will be focused on um, explaining sort of the definitions um, in an intuitive way, hopefully, of the various things that we try to do in persistent homology, which is probably like the foremost tool of TDA right now. Um, that will probably, well, we'll see, but I, I kind of expect that to potentially change in the future. Um, but if you look at topological data analysis pages, which are published today, the vast majority of them are going to like use ideas from persistent homology or be directly applying persistent homology. And there's a very strong temptation, I think, to use persistent homology as a black box, especially because um, topology isn't always the most approachable of mathematical subjects. Like a lot of mathematicians don't necessarily have background in topology. Even if they do, they may not have background in algebraic topology specifically. Um, and we have these software packages where you, know, you can put in your data and get something out. Um, but it turns out that there's actually a lot of geometry in these topological computations. And you know, I've become a little bit of a meme um, of an algebraic topologist on Twitter, but I think it's very sad that that geometry is kind of getting lost. Um, and it's really hard to get an introduction to it if you aren't learning topology from a very specific angle. So sort of the big goal of my talk today is going to be to try to take a lot of these like geometric ideas and really dive down into what the computational underpinnings are. So when you put data into one of these machines, what exactly are you doing and how do you interpret what comes out of it? Um, because these methods are actually and can be really interpretable. You don't have to treat them as something where like you take your data, put it in, get some kind of summary statistic and then just go with it. Um, so that's gonna be probably the bulk of my talk. I'll be pausing for questions a couple of times if you need any clarifications. Um, and you know, Heather will be moderating the questions in the chat. So please do feel free to drop them there. Okay, so let's start by talking about what algebraic topology is. Um, so this is a brief history in the sense of, I am imposing a narrative on the development of algebraic topology and you know, other people may have different narratives. And this specific narrative is very much aimed at getting you to a picture of algebraic topology that's convenient for this lecture. Um, so the sort of essential question in topology is that if you have a topological space or some kind of mathematical space, how do you reduce it down into invariants that tell you something about its shape? And when you look at sort of like early research in topology, um, it actually used to be called combinatorial topology. Um, so this is sort of where things like Betty numbers or Euler characteristics come from, if you're familiar with those um, constructs. But basically, you know, in the early days of topology, what it was about was taking a mathematical space and then sort of breaking it down into something combinatorial. So um, this could be like triangulations, this could be other kinds of complexes, and then performing these like 
very algorithmic computations in order to get out some kind of topological invariant. Um, and then, you know, Emmy Neutra came along and there's like a quote about how she wrote half a sentence and changed the field of topology. But essentially she made the observation that you could treat these topological invariants in groups instead of looking at these like big summary things like Betty numbers. Um, and that allowed us to take a much more granular view of like what a topological invariant is. So sort of the dominant practice in homology theory, which is a big part of algebraic topology today is take a space and then look at its holes. Um, so the sort of like really classical example of this is if you have like a donut and you can change it into like a coffee cup, probably some of you have seen this animation, if not, you know, YouTube it. Um, the idea is that somehow if we, oh, wrong click, let's see, there we go. If we have a donut that this is defined by kind of two holes, um, there's this hole around the middle here going this way. And then if it's like an, empty donut, so it's really a torus. Um, there's also this hole that goes around the rim of the torus, basically. Um, and that, in some sense, this is the same as, you know, a shape that looks like this, where we have this hole corresponding to this one and this hole here corresponding to this one. Um, so even though the precise shapes don't look the same, you know, we somehow have the same, like, topological properties. Um, and basically we can look at those holes there and they're going to generate an algebraic group. Um, and that's kind of like what a lot of algebraic um, topology is about. These days, if you look at the field, like a lot of it is really categorical. I'm not really going to be talking about that even though there are applications of like category theory and the parts of algebraic topology that look like category theory. If you're interested in that, you know, ask me a question or like send me a DM or something and you know, we can chat about what's out there. Okay, so. Let's move on. Um, so the key insight of topology is that like sometimes we don't really care about the precise shape of an object. What we really care about is the way that it's put together. And if we use that insight, we can do a lot of things. Um, maybe the one that comes up the most in applied topology is classification. So if we only look at the ways in which things are joined together, we can classify topological spaces, ideally up to homeomorphism. In practice, this turns out to be a bit hard. Um, but this is sort of where a lot of these ideas about like if you have a persistent homology, um, you know, you can put it through a machine learning algorithm and use it to classify shapes come from. Um, you can also understand what kinds of vector fields are possible on a manifold. So in a world with applications, we care about this because like you can think of a lot of um, processes or data sets as vectors over some space, right? Um, so if we understand like which vector fields are or aren't possible, that, that can tell us a lot about a specific application. And you can also use this to prove things about fixed points and their existence, which has applications to like steady states and things like this. Okay, so why should all of us care? Well, I kind of addressed it a little bit in the previous slide, but the sort of end point that you know I believe is that it's useful to think about how data is put together. So sometimes with data we have the same thing being true where we don't necessarily care about like the precise shape or the wiggly bits. Um, obviously that's not always true. There are applications like gerrymandering for example where we care a great deal about the precise shape. Um, but sometimes it's useful to just look at like how things are glued together and how things are connected and sometimes that's enough. Okay. So I'm going to go into now like a little bit of a description of some of the things that are out there in applied topology. These slides are really sparse, but there are a ton of slides at the end that are just like a long bulleted list of references that you can look into. Um, so some of the applications of things um, that are topological, but that we don't necessarily think of as TDA, well, we do think of them as TDA now, but some of these applications are really classical and sort of predated what's now called the field of TDA. Um, you can use, to algebraic topology to prove some impossibility theorems. So this is kind of related to the thing I mentioned before, where you can look at like what types of vector fields are possible or what types of steady states are, impos are possible. Um, so there are topological proofs, for example, of like various impossibility theorems from game theory or economics. Like I think there's one of Arrow's impossibility theorem comes to mind. Um, people have tried to apply this to social choice theory to sort of like varying success. So there are papers on that as well. Um, you can look at things like data structures. Um, you can think about data structures as being like topological objects. So you can think about a database, for example, as being like either a vector field or a simplicial complex or some kind of topological object over a manifold. 
Um, and if you understand how various kinds of manifolds can be glued together, that can tell you something about merging databases. So there's a lot of work by like David Spivak on topics around using like things from category theory or things from algebra to understand how to join data structures together and understand consistency of data sets. Um, there's also knot theory and circuit topology, which kind of tell you how to study patterns. These have been really useful in studying like protein structure and things like this. Okay. In terms of ways that you can study data with topology, probably the biggest thing is like connectedness. Um, you know, in some sense, you can think of topology as like the study of connectedness or how things are related to each other. Um, this makes it really nice for kind of pairing with networks because, you know, as you heard yesterday, like networks is about relationships and about connections, right? Um, and in a lot of ways, when you think about like a topological space, the core question you're asking about that space is what does it mean for things to be close together or what does it mean for things to be next to each other? Um, you know, we're also interested generally in things around the shape of data. This is especially true when we talk about really high dimensional data. Um, you know, frequently with social data sets, we have potentially like hundreds of columns, say, if you look at like the census data tables or whatever. Um, but we don't really think that that data actually is um, in some sense like, you know, a hundred or a thousand dimensional. A lot of the times our data lives in some kind of like lower dimensional setting where like maybe all of the data is distributed in a line um, if we're talking about like dimension reduction. Um, these are things that like topology is intended or to address in some ways because with topology what you're interested in is the sort of core intrinsic dimension and shape of the thing itself rather than the dimension that it's embedded into. Um, we can also look at like patterns and cycles. I sort of mentioned that knot theory and circuit theory are like some ways of looking at this. Um, but you know, one of the things we study with homology is like the existence of loops. So you can find cycles in your data. Um, and you can also find sort of more complicated patterns and motifs using some of these like knot theoretic approaches. Okay, um, so I'm gonna pause for questions just in case there's anything on like the very big picture. And well, I'll just send one to you for now, which is uh, just a clarification with uh, these shapes. You can mold them without changing overall properties, no breaking or cutting. Is that right? Yes, that's precisely correct. Yeah, so the idea is that because you can't cut anything and you can't glue anything, in some sense, this tells you about your connections, right? Because those are the ways you have of messing with connections. Great. OK, so let's go ahead and save the remainder for future question times and I'll let you keep going. Awesome. Okay. Um, so this is maybe getting into what might be the like less accessible part of this talk, but I'm going to do my best and please do ask questions if you're confused. Um, so this section of the talk is going to be talking about persistent homology. Um, persistent homology is, as I kind of already mentioned, um, one of the most, if not the most popular tool in TDA right now. And essentially what persistent homology is, is it applies something called homology theory to point clouds. And so what homology theory is, um, is it's essentially the study of like classifying sort of like holes or voids or spaces. There are a lot of different ways of thinking about this, um, but the core observation of homology is something like if you have, you know, let's say a circle. So this is S1, the circle that's not filled in um, that, you know, because we can make any deformations without breaking or cutting anything, we can classify this up to this space around the middle basically. Um, which, you know, is often referred to a hole or a void. And then in higher dimensions, we can look at in a torus, for example, I'm going to have to learn to draw toruses at some point. Um, you know, the rooms are the voids in the torus. And in the case of the torus, you know, I sort of already mentioned there's those two one dimensional loops that we can travel around. Um, but there's also a 2D void. And that's going to be kind of the space like inside the torus here that you, know, you can imagine like a part of a donut that is all the bread. Um, so homology theory basically is like take a space, find all of these voids, and then build algebraic groups out of those voids. So loosely what persistent homology does that's a little bit different than other homology theories, sorry, let me make this go away, um, is that instead of just doing this for a space, we actually want to look at a data set um, from a variety of different scales. And we want to look at the holes in the space as we change that scale. Um, so I'll draw some pictures, which will hopefully make that a little bit more clear soon. Um, so let's say we start with the data set. 
this is a point cloud. Um, if you, like me, spent many of your formative and maybe post-formative years playing Pokemon, um, you may recognize that this is a Jigglypuff. And, you know, as a human looking at this, it's really not that hard to tell that this thing is a Jigglypuff, if you've seen one before. Um, but maybe like, you know, you can imagine that I could stretch or scale this in all kinds of ways. I could embed it in much high, a much higher dimensional space. I could do a lot of things to make it a little bit more difficult to recognize. Um, so let's say that I want to put this into a computer and have it tell me like, maybe not that it's a Jigglypuff exactly, but at the very least that it's got a body and like maybe ears and two eyes. Um, then one of the things that I could do is I could consider taking a series of jiggly puffs where the dots get bigger and bigger. Um, so you might notice as I bring these dots bigger that there's sort of some nice area around maybe like this picture or this picture where the jiggly puff looks like really, really clear even compared to our original point cloud. Um, but if I you know, kept taking the dots larger and larger, eventually I would just end up with something like this, just one large amorphous blob that maybe conveys the idea of a Jigglypuff. Um, so what persistent homology would do essentially is you would take each of these different objects, which you know, we're later going to turn, how, look, turn into like a more rigorous topological object, but for now we'll just think of it as these like thickenings of dots where the dots get bigger and bigger. Um, and we look at where the topological features develop. So as I bring the dots bigger, you know, we can kind of see that around here, we can see one of the eyes form. And then maybe by the next picture, the other eye is also there. So now we've got two eyes. And you can imagine as the dots got larger, um, you know, eventually we would have like the circle around the body collect, connect to. Um, and what we would do is we would track, you know, taking these dots bigger and bigger, where do these features pop up and how long do they last? So we can see that like this, you know, there's like, maybe some, just trust me on this, there's some like small hole around the ear there. Um, but that's immediately disappeared in this next picture here. Um, so maybe in some sense, that's like not a feature we're looking for, but what we are looking for is things like the eyes, which pop up in this third image. And you can imagine, you know, through all of the images that I didn't put in the middle here, that it probably continues to persist for quite a few of them. Or this body hole, which maybe hasn't quite shown up yet, but we know it's going to appear at some point before eventually getting crushed out when the dots get big enough. Um, and so basically we would refer to the length of time that a feature shows up and stays around as its persistence. Um, and you know, the reason that persistent homology is called persistent homology is because we're very interested in this idea of persistence. Um, the thing that persistence is intended to model is sort of this idea that features that exist across a variety of scales are somehow more real than ones that don't. So that tiny little hole around the ear, maybe not real, maybe just noise. Um, but the eyes, which show up over a large variety of scales, those are a real feature and those are a feature that we care about. Um, so the basic workflow of persistent homology, should you attempt to do it, is you start with some kind of data set. So in this case, this could be my Jigglypuff, which would be like a point cloud. Um, and that's probably the most common thing we see in the literature, but you could also start with like a graph or a network. Um, images can work um, in a variety of different ways. You can either treat them as like a collection of pixels or you can treat them as manifolds. There, there are lots of different things you can do. Um, and basically you're going to turn that data into some kind of tractable topological object because I've kind of hand waved my way around like finding the holes in you know, that series of drawings of Jigglypuffs. Um, but that's not really an algorithm, right? I kind of just looked and told you where the holes were. So in order to come up with some kind of like combinatorial algorithm that's going to work on these data sets, we have to have a top tractable topological object first. And for the purposes of this talk, that object is going to be simplicial complexes. Um, so I'm not going to go into it here, but there are a number of different choices you can make about what type of topological object to build. Probably the most common one is simplicial complexes. That's what's in most of the like software packages, but you, you do technically have other options um, and some of them can be really useful. So it's really common to use something called the cubicle complex on images, for example, because they sort of generalize nicely. Um, and once you have that topological object, you know, we go through some kind of homology computation here. Um, and what we get out at the end is the homology groups. So these are going to be those algebraic objects groups that I spent, you know, a while expounding about earlier. Um, this is kind of our end goal. Um, 
so once you have homology groups, you can do a lot of things with them. I'll be talking a little bit later about like all of the different ways that, or not all of, some of the different ways that you can represent and work with homology groups. Um, but the idea is that in some sense, this is the information that you're most interested in. Um, and once you have that, you can treat it as a, as a summary, you can you know, use it to put into other methods, but this is the thing that I'm trying to teach you how to interpret today. Okay. So, um, now I'm gonna move into some de definitions. These slides may look like a little scary, but I'm gonna be drawing a lot of pictures. So if you read the definition and it means nothing to you, um, hopefully you know, some combination of pictures and verbal explanation will make it make sense. So the very first thing that I'm gonna define is a k-simplex, um, which you know, as you can see on the slide is a k-dimensional polytope, which is the convex hull of its k plus one vertices. And if that's not elucidating, um, which I, I don't expect it to be, <laughs> basically what a k-simplex is, is you take k plus one vertices. So let's say k equals zero and we take one vertex. Um, well, in that case, that's it. There's nothing else to do. We just have one vertex and this is our zero simplex. Um, the next possibility would be like a one simplex, which has two vertices. And then we need to take, you know, the convex hull of them, um, which is just going to be drawing a line between them. So your one simplex is going to be the line. Um, two simplices are going to be, you know, three points, the triangle, and filling in the triangle. A four simplex, or sorry, three simplex would be four points now, um, which, you know, you can kind of convince yourself is a tetrahedron. And then also all of the faces of the tetrahedron filled in and all of the like interior of the tetrahedron filled in as well. Um, and we could go on and on into higher dimensions though, you know, I will struggle increasingly to draw them as we get bigger. Um, so these simplices have what are called faces where the faces are just gonna be like the individual building pieces of that simplex. So for example, for the one simplex, the blue line there, we would have the two vertices on either end are going to be its faces. Um, if we look at the tetrahedron, it has a lot of different faces. All of its vertices are faces. All of the lines that go into the tetrahedron are faces as well. All of the triangles on the outside of the tetrahedron are faces as well. And that would be your full set of like faces of the three simplex. Um, so basically in order to be a simplicial complex, you have to do a couple of things. Um, the first thing is that anytime you are, if you're a, simpl you're a simplex and you're in the simplicial complex, then all of your faces actually also have to be in the simplicial complex. So, you know, if I have a simplicial complex that has a line in it, then not only does it have to contain that line, it also has to contain these two vertices at the end of the line. Um, and that's not necessarily obvious when you're modeling data. So you can imagine, for example, that like, you know, say I have a friend group of like eight people, I may not individually be friends with all of those eight people. So not everything sort of like naturally extends to a simplicial complex and that's why we need these kinds of assumptions. Um, the other thing that has to be true is that we care about the inter intersection of simplices in the simplicial complex. And what that means is we care about the ways that you're allowed to glue things together. So you're only allowed to put these things together in a certain variety of ways. And that's basically that you have to glue them along the face. So if, for example, I have a two simplex, like so, and I have a one simplex, there's only a handful of ways I can put them together. I can either not connect them at all, that's an option, because you know the empty simplex is a face of everything. Um, I can glue them along points or vertices. So I could say, example, connect to this point to this point, that would be okay. And then I would get you know a simplex that looked like this, and that would be fine. Um, or I could glue the line um, simplex to like any of the edges of the triangle and that would also be fine. But those are the only ways I'm allowed to like put these shapes together. There's nothing else I can do. I can't like cross anything. I can't, I don't know, somehow chop things up. Um, those are my only options. All right, so let's move on to the next slide. Um, so that was like a lot of text and a lot of pictures of triangles, but what does this look like in practice? Well. Let's say that I have something that I'm trying to turn into a simplicial complex. And let's say, let's start really simple. That thing is just the disk. Um, so I can actually turn this into a simplicial complex in a lot of ways, right? The only requirement that I have is that it be built out of simplices and that they be glued together in the right way. So maybe the most obvious, easiest thing I could do, um, well, maybe this isn't the most obvious, easiest thing, but you know, the first thing that I would think of is just turn it into a triangle. Um, so now I have, you know, these three vertices, these three lines, and then this triangle in the middle, and that's the same as the disk topologically. 
I could also think about just taking a single zero vertex, uh, a zero simplex, you know, that has the same topological properties as the circle because I could just shrink the circle all the way down into a single point. And that would be like, no, there's no cutting involved in that. There's no gluing involved in that. Um, but I could also just like in an odd ha ad hoc fashion start gluing random triangles on. So, you know, I could start with one triangle and then say, hey, why not just add 14 more? I'm not gonna draw 14 triangles. That was a bad, bad call. <laughs> add three more. Um, that thing is also a simplicial complex that is also the same as a circle. Um, so, you know, this may be like kind of troubling to think about because this means when we have a data set, we have like a variety of different ways of building simplicial complexes on it. And I haven't even started to get into the ways in which we could build a simplicial complex that maybe has different topological properties um, in ways that, you know, we think are okay. Um, given just like a simple disk, we've already got like an infinite number of possibilities for simplicial complexes that have the same topological properties. So when you're working with data, this is something that you have to think about really carefully because like all of the ways that the software packages give you or that you choose to build yourself of taking a data set and then turning it into a topological object are building in a lot of choices about like what an appropriate or what the right simplicial complex um, is. And you know those things are going to entirely determine the homology computations that come out of it later. So it's really important to understand when you have a data set what exactly the topological object you're building is. And the good news is this is usually like a pretty deterministic process. So usually you can say with like a very high degree of certainty what the thing you're building is. Um, and that allows you to interpret later what your computations are giving you. All right, so let's move on. Okay. Um, so I've talked a little bit about how to take like one object and turn it into one simplicial complex, but I haven't really mentioned scale at all. And when I showed you that Jigglypuff picture earlier, I was very interested in the question of scale, right? Like I kept taking these dots bigger and that somehow mattered. Um, so this is where the idea of like a filtered simplicial complex, sometimes called the filtration comes in. And basically what this is, is it's a simplicial complex that's somehow like actually a series of simplicial complexes. Um, so for example, I could take you know, as the beginning of my filtered simplicial complex, some set of vertices. And then in the next step, maybe I start to connect some of those vertices. And in the next step, maybe I, you know, connect some more. And then maybe in the next step, I add another vertex. The only thing that matters for a filtered simplicial complex is that you have to always be contained in the one that's after you. So I'm not allowed to take away any simplicities, but anything else works. Um, Intuitively, when we look at data, this is kind of where we start using things um, like those, like, you know, replace everything with a bigger dot and see what connects. Um, where usually with data, the way that we would build a filtered simplicial complex is we'd kind of look at the data from a variety of different scales and we'd basically treat each individual um, simplicial complex as being like an examination of the data at a slightly different scale where you're sort of blurring the dots increasingly, you're kind of like zooming out. Um, but that's not the only thing you can do. It turns out that like, you know, in some data sets, it doesn't work well for a variety of reasons. And technically you can build a filtered simplicial complex in any way that you want, as long as you aren't removing simplicities from one step to another. Um, so, you know, I'm about to go through a couple of the most common ways to build filtered simplicial complexes and none of these are particularly freeform, but if you do want to use like algebraic topology in your own research, you actually like also have a lot of options here. So you have the first set of options, which is like given one of these spaces, how do I turn it into one simplicial complex? But then there's the additional question on top of that of how do I like build the complex as a process? So how do I add simplices one at a time or whatever um, in order to like get an interesting result? And this is gonna have effects on what persistence means later because you know when I'm doing my homology computations, if what I'm interested in is where does the feature pop up? then it matters if I add this line in this step, for example, versus if I just you know, left it alone for this step and then added it in the next step. That's going to change where and when the topological properties show up. Um, so we do care a little bit about like what precisely these filtered simplicial complexes look like. Okay, next slide. Um, so the first simplicial complex I'm going to talk about is the most common one. This is the one that's going to be built in most of the like existing software packages. If you want to use something super out of the box, this is usually your option. Um, and this is basically precisely the picture of the Jigglypuffs that I showed you earlier. And what this looks like is if you have a point cloud, 
then we're just going to replace each of the dots in the point cloud with a series of epsilon balls, like so. Um, so I'm going to use a different color for each step of the simplex. And I'm not going to draw very many of them. <laughs> OK, maybe here we'll just take a really big one. OK, so in terms of turning this into a simplicial complex, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the intersections between all of these balls. So in this very first step, you can see that there's no intersections between any of these points. So the first step of your simplicial complex would just be these five zero simplices. Nothing is connected, nothing happens. Um, same thing in this next picture. These balls are still not big enough. So nothing is connected yet. We have you know, the same exact simplicial complex that we did before. Um, now in this green one, we're starting to get a little bit interesting. Um, we can see now that some of the green balls actually overlap. Um, so what that's going to look like in simplicial complex land is now we have two zero vertices there that are still not connected to anything. But these guys are now connected up. So now we have a line there on the right side, you know, in addition to our original two vertices. And then in this last simplicial complex, what's going to happen, um, this is where things get really, really interesting. So we still have you know, one lonely dot off to the side. Um, and we now have all of these dots. So we can see that these two balls intersect here, these two. Um, so we're gonna put a line there. Same thing for these two, these two, and these two. And then the other interesting thing that's happened is that if you look at these sort of northwest, northeast, northeast three balls, um, all of those three balls like intersect with each other pairwise. So we're also going to color in the middle. Um, and you may observe that whenever you have three points, all of which intersect with each other pairwise, you sort of automatically get a filled in triangle. Um, you don't really have any choices there. But let's say we have five points, or well, I'm drawn six here. Let's say you have six points. That no longer becomes true. You may not have all of those pairwise intersections. And so in this case, maybe we don't have any filled in triangles, even though like the balls kind of all intersect pairwise. Um, so the thing we're interested in is whenever we have k plus one balls, if all of them intersect pairwise, then we put a k simplex there. Um, so in this particular drawing, we basically have the filtered simplicial complex, which starts like so, stays exactly the same for one step, and then at the next step becomes this shape, and then at the last step becomes this shape. And that would be our Vitoris Rips complex on my hastily drawn series of five dots. Okay. Um, so that's the sort of standard way of getting a um, simplicial complex out of a point cloud, but you can also build simplicial complexes off of other things. Um, so something we've been talking a lot in this course is networks and graphs. Um, so I'm going to talk about the quick complex, which is like, you know, one of the main ways that you can build a simplicial complex out of a graph. And basically, um, how a click complex works is, let's say I have a graph that looks like this. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for all of the clicks in the graph. So those are going to be subsets of the graph where like everything is connected to everything else. Um, so, for example, in this case, you know, the sort of noticeable bigger clicks is that I have a three click there. Um, and I have another click here of these four points where all of the four points are pairwise connected to everything else. So what I'm going to do to make a click complex out of this is I'm just going to take those clicks and I'm going to turn them into simplices. Um, so we have once again the zero simplex off to the side. We have this click turning into a triangle. We have this click turning into a tetrahedron that is filled in from how that's indicated. And then we also have that there connecting them. And that's going to be the simplicial complex that comes out of our graph. Um, so if you have, for example, like a graph that's evolving over time, so long as you're only ever adding edges and not deleting them, you could turn that into a filtered simplicial complex of click complexes. Um, you could also, like, if you have some kind of dynamical process on the graph, use that dynamical process to inform the order in which you're going to put simplices into your simplicial complex. There's a lot of different ways that you can do this, um, but suffice it to say, you're not relegated to working with point clouds. Like, there are ways to use these kinds of, like, constructions on networks as well. Okay. Um, oh. Sorry. All right. 
Um, so I'm not really going to talk in detail about these for the interest of time, but suffice it to say that like what passes for fast in the topological world isn't always reasonable for like an applied mathematician. Um, when I say this, like there are multi exponential algorithms for computing some topological things and that's not really something that we're willing to live with like as a topologist, you know, we can say, hey, the algorithm exists, we did it, but that's not really computable in any real sense. Um, and even with, you know, the pictures that I was drawing before of Vitoris Rips complexes and click complexes, of which are relatively simple objects, well, with the Vitoris Rips complex, you have to check every pairwise possibility. Um, and sometimes that can be really fast in a pairwise distance matrix. But once you've checked all the pairwise possibilities, you also have to check every possible simplex. So as your number of points gets really high, it's possible for your Vitoris Rips complex construction to get really, really slow because the number of possible simplicities that you have just absolutely balloons, um, especially like with high dimensional data. Um, so basically there are a variety of different ways that you can make your complexes go faster. Um, you know, alpha complexes, witness complexes, flag complexes, all of these are examples. There are a bunch more examples. Um, and, you know, if you are interested in any of these, um, there are references at the very end of the slides that you can use to look at how these things are built. Okay, um, and then sort of the like terminal note of everything that I've said about simplicial complexes is that like there really is a lot of room to get creative here. Um, you can build a simplicial complex in so many different kinds of ways. And if you look at the papers that are linked at the very end of the slides, um, there's a variety of papers about different applications of TDA. And a lot of them do use things like Vitoris Rips complexes or complexes that are very closely related to them. Um, but there are also a lot of papers, including like some of my own, including um, one by like Elena Katafori, um, which you know do get really creative with how they choose to build these complexes. And sometimes in an application that can make all of the difference because you know when we're studying people, for example, um, and we look at point clouds of people, physical distance between people doesn't always mean that there's like a relationship between them, right? Um, so sometimes the standard ways of building a simplicial complex are gonna fail because they use these ideas of distance and of nearness, which are very intuitive, um, but don't always reflect the data. So if you do end up, you know, wanting to use TDA, like I really encourage you to think a lot about like what the different ways you can build a simplicial complex are and how that's going to affect the computations that you do later. All right, so I'm going to pause for questions again here because I imagine there might be some. <laughs> we have loads of amazing questions in the chat. I'm going to just give you two right now. Uh, the first, this is an awesome question. Um, if we're looking at shapes in data or regions like for gerrymandering, what's the advantage of using topology as opposed to geometry? Mm. So um, there are a couple of answers to this question. The first is that like naively, you know, topology isn't a great tool because it doesn't tell you about any reasonable human notion of compactness. And that's true. Um, the sort of follow up to that, though, is that like, you know, for example, Moon Dukin just put out a paper um, on using topology to look at like di district redrawing. Um, and that number one, these methods do capture some geometric information just because like, you know, when you build a Vitoris Rips complex or something like this, often the like notion of physical distance or scale is automatically built in. And so because of that, you know, examination of scale, you end up with some geometric features in addition to your topological ones. Um, and kind of the last point to that is like maybe not extremely useful for detecting gerrymandering in a map that's already drawn. Um, but, you know, these notions of like connectedness and thinking about how these things are put together and how maps are put together can be useful to inform our understanding of like why maps look the way they do, why they're drawn the way they're drawn. Um, so maybe you can't apply topological tools and get like a nice measure of how gerrymandered something is, but you can study phenomena that are like important to the whole process of gerrymandering. Great, thanks. And one more, there's a couple different questions that touch on this theme, so I'm just going to choose one of them, um, which is around the theme of how persistent homology responds to different scales in data. Um, what differences in variance show up when you choose different choices for epsilon, when you choose different coordinates for your data, and, and so on. Can you give us a touch on that a little bit? Um, so <laughs> I think the thing that was for a long time the wisdom in this field is oh scale shouldn't matter because if you just take enough filtration steps and they're fine-grained enough you will somehow eventually capture all of the possibly interesting scales 
Um, that's not like a computationally feasible answer in any way. So realistically, when you're using these methods, if you are going to use something like a Vitoris Rips complex, um, where scale corresponds very precisely usually to some notion of distance in your um, point cloud or data set, that choosing scales becomes like kind of a parameterization problem. Um, and there are a lot of different ways you can approach this. Like one thing that you know I've seen done in research or that I've done myself is you can kind of like throw something at a Vitoris Rips complex and see, you know, use some very like chunky scale basically. And you'll usually find that there are more features at certain scales than others. And that can kind of inform you how to like select a better set of scales. So if I, you know, throw something at a Vitoris Rips complex, put it through a persistent homology computation and find that all of my features are occurring in precisely one value of epsilon, then maybe I change my values of epsilon to be around there in you know, some sort of smaller range rather than whatever larger range I had before. But realistically, it's a hard problem. Scale matters quite a lot. Um, and you know, you're going to have to figure out how to deal with that, unfortunately. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. OK, I'm going to save the rest to the end. Keep them coming. They're awesome. All right, um, so now I'm going to move on to the actual homology part of the computation. Um, so you should think of the homology computation as, or persistent homology as being like this workflow that has a lot of different steps. And I've kind of just talked about the first step, um, but this is the you know step that maybe we do the least to modify, um, but which is also, I think, often like maybe the least understood by people who aren't already topologists. Um, so basically, homology theory is anything that associates a sequence of algebraic objects to topological spaces, which is very, very vague. Um, but usually the thing that we use them for in applied topology is categorizing the holes in a manifold. Um, so, you know, I've talked about there being a lot of different types of topological objects we can use already. Um, I just want to reiterate that, like, you know, you can technically compute homology on a lot of different types of things. Right now, I'm going to show you how to do that computation on a simplicial complex. But the computation looks almost exactly the same on other versions of these complexes, um, which is you know, a little bit complicated, but we'll get through it. Um, so this is the definition, or this is a definition for homology. Um, so let's suppose that we start with a simplicial complex. Then we're going to construct something called chain complexes over the simplicial complexes. Um, and then we're going to look at the maps between those chain complexes. Um, so, for example, in a simplicial complex, I'm going to use a very, very simple simplicial complex um, to hopefully make our lives easy, and that's just going to be the triangle. So, if we want to look at the chain complex on the triangle, then we're going to have only three possible dimensions, um, because in any other dimension there are no simplices. Um, so, we have C2, which is going to consist of the two simplices, which in this case is just going to be the triangle itself. Um, and then formal sums of that two simplex. So there is some sense in this chain complex that in an algebraic way, I can add the triangle to itself. Um, there's no like physical intuition to that. So try not to worry about it too much. For the purposes of this talk, the thing that matters is that the triangle is part of that chain complex. Um, so in C1, we're gonna have the one simplices and formal sums of the one simplices. So we're basically there going to have three, possible lines. Um, and that's going to be the building blocks of C1. So we just have in here three different one simplices. And then similarly, in C0, we're going to have three different zero simplices. And those are going to be the building blocks of our C0. Um, so that's kind of like what our chain complexes are made of. Um, so on top of these chain complexes, we're going to have a map that goes from one step to the next. So here we're going to have delta 2 and delta 1. And these things are called boundary operators. And they work basically the way that you maybe think they should, which is to say, when you take the boundary of the triangle, you get all of the lines around it. And when you take the boundary of like a line, you get the two points at the end of it. Um, so the sort of additional confounding factor is that there is some notion of orientation on these boundary maps. Um, so for example, you know, when I take the boundary of Am I back? Cool. Um, so in some sense, it actually matters what order I go around the triangle, um, which is to say, in this case, order maybe doesn't matter so much, but direction really does. So not only am I getting back those three lines around the outside of the triangle, I'm getting them going in certain directions. 
Um, and then when I take the boundary of, you know, a line, again, it sort of matters that the line goes in this direction um, in terms of like what my boundary is. So the thing that turns out to be true about the boundary maps with the orientations, the way that we've constructed them, is that when you take the boundary of a boundary, you always get zero. So in this triangle example, if I take the first boundary, you know, I get these three lines going around. And if I take the boundary of that again, what's going to happen is I'm going to add a point, subtract a point, add a point, subtract a point, add a point, subtract a point. And if you, you know, were able to follow that, um, which I wasn't, you'll notice that I added and subtracted each of the vertices exactly once. And so what I get out is zero. Um, so once we have that property, we're basically going to look at what gets mapped to zero. Um, we're going to look at the, the kernels and the images of these maps. So the homology is a process that's kind of taking place in between these two like boundary maps, um, where we're going to look at things that are in the kernel of this one that are not in the image of this one. And intuitively, what that works out to is you look at things that are, you know, look like they could surround a cycle. That's going to be your kernel. Um, and then you throw out anything that actually is filled in, which is going to be your image of the other map. Um, so basically, whenever you're looking at a homology group, the elements of that homology group are going to be precisely the things that look like boundaries, but are not filled in by anything. So this is how you get that intuition for like loops. Um, when we're looking at the first homology group, you know, we're going to look for things that surround some kind of space, but themselves have nothing inside. Um, and the only set of things that are going to correspond to that are going to be these loops that are empty. Okay, cool. Um, so the kind of key takeaway of that computation is that when it comes to data, that means that your homology groups are entirely determined by what your syntheses are. So when you have data and you've constructed some kind of simplicial complex on it, if you know what your one simplices are and you know what your two simplices are, that means you know exactly what the elements of your homology group are. And I think this is something that like doesn't get stressed very much. Um, so for example, when I take a Vitoris Ritz complex and I see that there's something in the homology group, the first homology group specifically, that means that I have one simplices that form some kind of cycle, but there's no two simplex in the middle. And if I take that a step further, that means what I have is a bunch of points in the point cloud that are connected enough to make all of these one simplices, but pairwise they're not connected enough to like fill in the space in between. Um, so this can give you like, no matter what kind of simplicial complex you construct, as long as you track what your simplices are, you can say exactly what the elements of the homology group are. So if you do get really creative with the way that you, you know, build out your simplicial complexes, this is how you interpret what you're getting out of it. Okay, um, so you know I've explained what a homology computation is, but once again, I've kind of left aside the question of scale. So how does this work with you know those the filtered simplicial complexes, which have the scale built in? Um, basically, we're oh, going to start with a diagram where we have all of our steps of the filtered simplicial complex. Um, so I've drawn arrows between them because there are maps between these, right? Because S0 is included in S1, which is included in S2, and so on and so forth. Those inclusions are themselves maps, um, where, you know, every element of S0 just maps to itself in S1. Um, you'll notice that they're not on two. There are going to be things in S1 that aren't in S0, potentially, um, depending on how you draw your simplex, but we're not going to worry about that. Um, so each of these things via, you know, the homology computation on the previous slide, gets mapped to its homology groups. Oh, sorry. I haven't told you those maps exist yet. Oh, there's a ruler, that's scary. Um, okay, so those homology groups exist in terms of being like the homology group of each of the things in the filtered simplicial complex. But the thing that's really neat about homology is that not only do we have like these down arrows, we also now have maps between all of the homology groups. Um, and those maps correspond to the inclusion maps that I was showing you in the filtered simplicial complex. So what this means is that if we have an element that belongs in this homology group here, it actually maps to something in this homology group. And maybe the thing that it maps to is zero, in which case, you know, I'll talk about that in just a second. But that means that if I have a feature at any one of these scales, I can actually track it through all of the scales. So in the picture of the Jigglypuff, not only do I know there's an eye, I know that the eye is here and here and here and here until it's not there anymore. Um, so this allows us to do a couple of things. First, it tells us like, you know, for any given feature, I know how long it lasts because I know, you know, which of these 
homology groups it exists in and when it gets mapped to zero. Um, I also know like the first homology group that it shows up in, because if I have a feature that shows up in this group that wasn't in this group, for example, I know that it can't have gotten into the simplicial complex any earlier. Um, so when I do a persistent homology computation, um, you know, I get a variety of pieces of information out. Um, but basically, you know, usually what we get from persistent homology is we're going to get some list of features that, you know, are going to be ordered in something. So if you look at your software packages, um, often what this looks like is it's just going to spit out like some list and that list is going to tell you a bunch of things. The first thing is that it's going to tell you the dimension of the feature. So if a feature lives in HM of S of I, then it has dimension M. So for example, you know, the eyes and the Jigglypuff live in H1, therefore they're one dimensional features. Um, the connected components of any particular point cloud are going to live in H0, so they're going to be zero dimensional features. Um, you also can, not all packages do this, but you can get out generators of X. Um, and what I mean by generators of X is basically that gives you a way of going from X, the loop, to the simplicial, like simplices in the simplicial complex that generated it. So I know that it's this loop, and I know that this set of points in the Jigglypuff make up that I. Um, the thing about the generators is that they're not necessarily unique. So if I were to try to do this in the Jigglypuff example, maybe I'd get really lucky and I'd just get like a series of dots around the eye. Um, but sometimes you, you don't get lucky and you'll get some seemingly random, you know, maybe the eye is here and you get some like other series of dots. Um, and this has to do with like the fact that these groups, uh, like these homology groups are sort of representation. Um, each element is like kind of a representative of a class rather than a specific thing. Um, but those generators can be useful in some contexts and in some applications, it turns out that you have ways of like making your generators nice. Or, well, you don't make the generators nice, but any set of generators will kind of give you the information that you want. Um, the other thing that you get that I sort of alluded to is you know where the first homology group that that thing popped up in is. So you know what scales it exists in, um, and that gives you like a birth and a death. So the birth is going to be the first scale where that feature pops up, and then the death is going to be the last or the first place where it no longer exists. Um, so if we have like X in a homology group, usually what happens is we kind of have, you know, X popping up in one of the groups, it keeps going, it keeps going, it keeps going, it keeps going, and then maybe it eventually becomes zero. This place where it becomes zero is going to be the depth of that particular um, element. Noticeably, it's possible that it never becomes zero. And if it never becomes zero, then we're gonna refer to it as being an element that has like infinite persistence. Um, okay, so once you have this list of things, you can do like a lot of different kinds of representations. So I'm going to be going through like two, three of the most common ones, and then I'll break for final questions. Um, so the first thing you can do is something called the barcode. The thing about barcodes that's nice is that you can kind of see every feature at the same time, which can be a useful property. Um, and basically what you do is for a barcode, if you have a feature that is born at zero and dies at two, then you just draw a line from zero to two. Then if you have another feature that's born at one and dies at three, you draw a line one to three. And then let's say you have a feature that's born at four and then persists into infinity. You know, I would start at four, draw a line out to the right and maybe put like an arrow at the end to indicate that it never dies. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of different ways that I could visualize this. Um, so one thing I could do is I could say each dimension of my um, homology group is going to have a different barcode. And then we'll just look at all the barcodes separately. You could color different dimensions, different colors. Um, but barcodes are mostly like a visual aid. Um, there are some other ways of working with them. But like the main time that you would choose to use a barcode is one where you just want to see what all of your features are and kind of get a sense of like where the longest bars are. Um, and the longest bars on the barcode are going to be the most persistent. OK. Um, your next option is something called the persistence diagram. These have become really common because they're really convenient to work with in a lot of ways. Um, oh, sorry. Trying to get the pencil. Um, so what a persistence diagram is, is basically we're going to have like something that kind of looks like a scatter plot. Um, or basically, if I have a feature that's born at 0, 2, then I'm just going to plot it at 0, 2. And then I'm just going to plot all my features in this way. Um, so you'll notice that because everything has to die after it was born, like things are going to be above or potentially on the diagonal if they only exist for one. Um, actually, no, that can't happen. Yeah, so they're going to be above the diagonal always. Um, and you could do the same thing that you know I mentioned with the persistence uh, with the barcodes, which is to say that you could either put everything on the same diagram, but do it in different colors to indicate that they're different dimensions, or you could have a separate um, diagram for each dimension, whatever you want. 
Um, one of the things that's really nice about persistence diagrams is that you can actually compute the distances between persistence diagrams in some sort of like reasonably rigorous way. So this means that if you have like two different data sets and you have two diagrams for them, you can actually compare those diagrams and say something about how close together or far apart this particular topological summary is. Um, the last one that I'm going to explicitly mention is um, persistence images, which basically is very similar to a persistence diagram, but it turns the persistence diagram into a vector. And the way that it does this is that I kind of drew like a point on the persistence diagram before. Instead of that, what you do is you put a probability distribution where each of those points are, and then you would discretize it into an image. Um, and the main advantage of this method is that images are vectors. So once you have like a vector that represents your topological information, you can put that into like a machine or learning algorithm, um, any algorithm that takes in vectors, basically, this becomes a potential input for. Um, so that's like a really useful thing that you can do with persistence images. Um, okay, so I think we are basically out of time, but quickly, there's a lot of references in these slides once I post them. Um, there's going to be a section on kind of like algebraic topology and current developments in TDA. Um, there's going to be a section on like applications of persistent homology specifically. So I think I've tried to order these vaguely by topic. Um, and then there's also going to be a final section on like topological applications, which are not persistent homology. So please do look through those and hopefully you will find some of them interesting or elucidating. Okay, thanks. All right, thanks so much, Michelle, for your nice talk. Uh, lots of great questions. We won't have time to get to all of them. So let me just field a couple. Uh, the first, this is actually a combination of two questions, but I think it's quite nice. So in terms of application of TDA, are there advantages uh, over using, maybe if you're doing something like image recognition, over using conventional machine learning methods or using something like k-nearest neighbors for clustering? Um, so two answers to this question. Um, there are topological methods that are actually very similar to k-nearest neighbors. So if you look at like Mapper, for example, um, some of the ideas there are really related. In terms of explicit advantages, um, the answer that I usually get give to this question, because I get it a lot, is that like in terms of, you know, speed or performance, it's actually really hard to tell if there are any advantages. Um, but I think the upside is that these methods are like really don't have to be a black box. Um, they really can be super, super interpretable. You can know exactly what you're building um, and you can know exactly what you're getting out of them. And that's not always true of machine learning methods. Um, I also suspect that there are probably classes of problems that we can address with topology that we haven't really built out the tools for yet. Like right now, there's really only persistent homology that's super well developed. And people are developing like new topological tools that give us new ways of thinking about how like spaces are put together. Um, and most machine learning tools don't really have this like idea of global structure that's somehow like intrinsic to the, like I think there are a lot of attempts at approximating this, um, but in terms of like mathematical methods um, on the theoretical side, topology is like kind of unique in the particular way that you think about or formulate ideas of shape or connectedness. Um, so my personal view is that like surely those ideas have to be like useful somewhere. Um, we'll find out, I guess. <laughs> Great, thanks. Okay, next question. I'm gonna also combine two questions. Um, the first part of this question is, maybe to, can you give us a bit of a, your opinion about how applied topology is different from theoretical topology and in particular, the difference in the questions that are asked? Yeah, um, so one of the things that I kind of alluded to is that the view of topology that I've given here and kind of the tutorial um, is like a really, really classical way of thinking about topology. So if you're, you know, a young theoretical topologist embarking on your education, um, you will see these ideas kind of very early on, but this is not how a lot of modern topology looks. So this focus on like building complexes on like the geometry of it all is much less prominent now than it used to be. That said, I think there are all kinds of like interesting questions that come from these you know, more applied side. If you look at like some of the work that's happening in TDA, um, there have been a lot of questions in terms of like, okay, 
we know supposedly that there are theorems that tell us that these Vitoris Ritz complexes have to behave in certain ways on a point cloud. But in practice, that doesn't happen. And this has led to like a lot of interesting theoretical complexes about like, okay, we thought we knew what all of the Vitoris Ritz complexes of a circle are. Maybe we don't actually know. Maybe this is something we actually have to study um, on the theoretical side. So there is some interplay, but like there are massive parts of the field that just aren't really in the applied literature. Like, um, you know, I've sort of talked about one version of a homology theory. And I think something that's really confusing to people who, you know, start getting studying homology is that there are actually like a lot of different homology theories. It can be unclear when to use which ones. Some of them are really, really abstract. Um, you know, we're now coming up with like versions of homology theories that are just kind of supposed to work on diagrams generally. Um, when do you have like a categorical diagram that has these properties? Um, and that's like a really, really different thing than the thing I'm talking about here, where we have these very concrete data sets that we're building these very concrete objects out of. Um, and as far as I know, like that, there's some work on applied category theory, but most of it is um, like really, really arcane still. Very interesting, but definitely arcane. <laughs>